Okay, welcome everybody. I uh, got settled in. Let's start in a moment. So I am uh, Mike Morneau. I will be your one of your producers today. And uh, if you require tech support with the Zoom platform at any point in time, please communicate with me using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. As well, you'll note at the bottom of the screen is a Q&A box or a Q&A button. If you want to click the Q&A to ask any questions of our presenters today, and that way we'll be able to uh, better monitor and, and respond to the questions. And please leave the chat to uh, comments and um, if you wish to say hello, feel free to do that there. You'll see at the bottom of your screen also is a CC button, CC live transcript. If you require closed captioning today, please feel free to click that button to enable and show the subtitles. So without further delay, I'll pass things off to our host, Robin Bauer Kilgo. Go ahead, Robin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another C2C Care webinar. Um, today, you're here for What's Best for My Collection, New Approaches to Environmental Monitoring. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge that this webinar is being moderated on the traditional lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people and their ancestors, and I pay my respect to elders both past and present. So before we start um, with our speakers today, I wanted to run through a couple of quick slides um, as for upcoming program and some other things that will be happening. Yes, next slide. Again, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator. Um, you just saw Mike Morno. He's our senior producer at Learning Times. Again, if you have tech questions, feel free to use that chat box and Mike will be there to help you. We have a home on the web, connecting to collections.org. Hopefully that's where you found us to register for this webinar. On that website, you'll be able to see all sorts of fun stuff. So I encourage everyone to go there if they have a chance to. On the website, we have our webinar archive, which includes archives going way back all the way to the late, the early 210s. Also our courses archive. Um, there's also some great resources, which are curated by the C2C Care group um, and a jump to our community page. So everything can be found there on the website, again, connecting to collections.org again, our community. The nice thing about the community is that it is moderated or monitored by a bunch of um, conservators who have volunteered their time. So if you have a question about collections care or anything in your, uh, that you might be dealing with, please put it there and we'll have a great group of experts and monitors who will be able to answer it for you. So I do encourage anyone who has questions about collections care to use that community when they have a chance. You can also find information on our program on two places on social media, on our Facebook page, which is C2C Community, and over at C2C Care, which is also our Twitter handle. So again, if you're looking for information, news items, anything else fun, please join us on both those platforms. We do have an upcoming webinar on May 19th that I would encourage everyone to go take a look at. Um, it's called Collections Emergency Kits, and it's part of AIC's May Day Prep activity. We get to discuss all sorts of fun new uh, collections emergency kits. There's a new guide out there to help you build one if you're interested in it. So again, if you're interested in that subject, I would encourage you to go and register for that free webinar happening May 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern. As Mike said, you have two options within, the, within this platform to communicate to our group. You have the chat box, which is there for everyone to say hi. I think there's lots of hi Susans happening in there right now, which is great. Um, and then we have the Q&A box. If you have a question for our panelists, I do encourage you to use that Q&A box. It just helps us keep track of the questions as time goes on. But um, if you want to talk, say again, hi to Susan. If you want to uh, share what number COVID shot you happen to be on right now, feel free to use that chat box. That's the place to do that. So today we are really excited because we're gonna be doing the what's best for my collection, new approaches for environmental monitoring. We have two presenters today that you'll be hearing from. Um, one is Susan Barger. Susan has worked in the field of conservation for over 40 years in various capacities. As a conservation scientist, a university professor in material science, and working on professional development, she was also the former C2C care coordinator, so we're excited to have her back on the program. 
And we have Austin Sensman, who's CEO of Conserve. Um, Austin started his academic career in qualitative and quantitative social science research. Um, and he works, has worked within the field with big data and cloud community, com, well, excuse me, cloud computing. He kind of switched gears and joined us over in the museum or the cultural field, where now he works on effective preventative conservation tools, starting with environmental monitoring. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I'm going to hand control over to Austin and Susan, and we will see you at the end of this presentation for a Q&A period. I'll also quickly add that we're going to have a survey for everyone to fill out at the end, and there's also a handout on our website that I'll link in the chat as well for all of you to access. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Austin and Susan. See you soon. Hi, everyone. Um, OK, so um, I'm speaking to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is the land of the Tehuas speaking pueblos of the Rio Arriba region of the Rio Grande. Um, and we're going to talk about environmental monitoring. So. Austin, you're in charge of me, so let me have the next slide. <laughs> um, so I, I saw what Conserve was doing and I was interested in it because I think as preservation professionals, we've often done a bad job at letting people know what to do with environmental data. So looking at it, the museum environment, which was was first talked about and written about in the 1970s and 80s. There, were, uh, there was an important book uh, by Gary Thompson and there were some international meetings. And um, there were a lot of different things that we told people they needed to do. Um, and then, can I have the next? Austin, wake up. And then in the 1990s, the CCI and then uh, uh, the CCI talked about the 10 agents of deterioration. And so we began throwing those around and some of those have to do with environment, water, humidity, temperature, uh, pollutants. And we, digital data loggers were, were introduced. And then uh, in the 2000s, we began having more uh, collections focused monitoring tools. In the 2010s, there were international protocols that were set up uh, and national protocols about uh, environments and museums and libraries and archives. And we still were not very good at letting people know how to uh, analyze data. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And now in the 2020s, we have some new stuff. So let's go on to the next. So what's involved in environmental monitoring? So first of all, you need to collect data. And so that data you could collect with a, a hydrothermograph or with a thermometer and a, a, a psychrometer. You, you could also uh, use a light meter, that kind of stuff. And then once you have this data, you should, analyze it so you should understand what things are going you know what works what's not and then um, you share it with the people who are your stakeholders with your building management with the people that you work with in your museum or your archive or your library and hopefully you use that to take better care of your environment but unfortunately, a lot of times what happens is things get stuck in data collection. And um, so people get stacks of data, you know, big rolls of hydro hydrothermographs, or they get, they have, uh, uh, you know, a database where they're looking at it, but they don't know quite what to do with the analysis. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's go on to the next slide. So Rob Waller, who began looking at risks, says, in its simplest, most absolute sense, the goal of preservation is, is to make sure that a collection which people receive at time x 
will last until time Y or, or until forever, because that's what our job is as um, preservation. And what's happened in the last 10, 15, almost 20 years is we have now said to all of you that managing your collections environment is a requirement for good collections care. But we haven't necessarily said what it is that you need to do once you get all this data, except that you need to do something. So we could have the next slide. So the, the perceived constraints to good outcomes of getting information is that collecting data is manual, it's time consuming, that uh, maybe you could have wireless stuff, but it's, uh, it might be, um, it, it might be uh, hard to, expensive, it might be difficult to maintain. Um, analyzing environmental data and is hard. And a lot of people think that you need to leave it to conservators or to building engineers, but what happens if you're in a, in a institution that has neither of those things? Um, and that sharing environmental data is complicated. And that means sharing it with people that are in your team. Um, and then there's not much you can do to improve your outcome because maybe you found out that there was an incident with your environment two weeks ago, but it's already passed. And so we'd like to help change that. Um, we can go into the next slide. So these are the things that, that Conserve is hoping that collections data could be automated and, and effortless and that uh, wireless could be inexpensive and simple. And that environmental data should be straightforward to anyone with collections experience. And that sharing that data should be simple and you should be able to use the data so that everyone can understand it and there's always something you can do to improve your data or to improve your environment so um this is, this is the very large array on the plains of saint augustine if you've heard the dylan song um in Dattle, New Mexico. And these are huge radio telescope receivers. This, this radio telescope has 28 of these things and they can stretch out over 28 miles. Whereas sometimes they're all crammed together. It depends on what they're doing. But it's collecting data all the time. And the thing that's interesting about it is that None of it would make any sense if there weren't people there to understand this data and to put it out in ways that, that other people can use it. So um, that's that's a really important thing is, and and for me, the, the reason that we have this slide is that I really wanna have practical, accessible, inexpensive tools for people in small institutions so that they can understand this stuff. I don't want them to keep piles of their environmental data that they bring out um, when they have a survey or if uh, someone asks them if they keep do environmental monitoring, I want them to have tools that they can say, yes, we do and we use it, we use it. Okay, now I'm in it turn this over to Austin. I was interested in Conserve because um, I heard Austin several times and I was curious about what they were doing. So, Austin. Hey, I'm Austin Sensman. I am the CEO of Conserve. And I wanna thank you, um, Susan, for inviting me to tell this story and thank you to the FAIC and the Connecting the Collections Care team um, for allowing us to be here today. So CEO is kind of a fancy title. Really, I'm a person who leads a group of people who spend every day trying to make things a little easier for people to take care of collections. 
And uh, the way we do that is we, we go out into the world and we, we listen to people. And so I think I like to start a little story about how we got into this business to understand uh, kind of what we're about. So uh, my background is not in collections care. Um, I mean, I guess increasingly every day, more and more it is. Um, but I came to this field uh, after uh, an early career in analytics. So helping people take numbers and use those numbers to make decisions. That's kind of the Fisher Price way that we talk about it. It's taking data and, and turning it into information. And my partner, Nathan McMinn, uh, is a software engineer. So we had these really interesting skill sets. And we went out in the world and were in search of an interesting business to start. And the person on the screen is Margaret Burnham, someone who uh, has a very warm place in my heart. Margaret was the first person to walk me around the museum collection and show me how environmental monitoring was done. She also happens to be my co-founder, Nathan's mother. Um, and so this was through this interesting um, confluence of events where we were in a museum thinking about how we could use sensors, data and analytics to help people improve outcomes. And we got to see the museum case really up close. And it wasn't just talking about it, she actually took us around the museum and we went through the whole process together. And it was our first time seeing this and we thought, hmm, you know, like this feels like it could be better. Um, and that was sort of our assumption. And so we went out and we really started talking to a lot more people about, uh, you know, what's difficult about this? How would you like it to be? What's in your way? These kinds of questions. And the thing we kept hearing over and over again, which we heard early from Margaret, is that this is a bit of a hassle. And part of the problem is that most of the tools that are available to do this kind of work, they're built by folks who don't necessarily focus on collections care. And wouldn't it be nice, and you'll see this as a theme that comes up over and over again, wouldn't it be nice if we had some tools that were built for us? Um, and so that's kind of what we got to work on. And I wanna come back to the slide that uh, Susan showed briefly. As we were looking at this from the outside initially, we identified these four areas where uh, people need to be successful to do environmental monitoring well. And these aren't just parts of the process. These also turn out to be the places where people can get stuck. So, you know, data collection is too hard. We don't know how to analyze the data. It's hard to share. So they're the steps that make people successful while at the same time, they're also the places where people get stuck and they can't get the outcomes uh, that they want. So Susan went through some of these perceived constraints and then how at Conserve, we aspire to see the world. So these are the, each one of these areas that you saw on the slide. So data connect, collection, analysis, sharing, and outcomes. And when we hear people feel stuck in each one of these areas, what we try to imagine is a world where we can deliver tools, education, resources, so that people start to say things that sound more like this. If you read any of these sentences, these are the feelings of being unstuck. These are the feelings of you know, making progress. And so this is really at the core of what we think about when we work on monitoring. And so what I'd like to do today to get started with everyone is in each one of these areas, collection, analysis, communication outcomes, we've quickly put together a little maturity model, right? And a maturity model is, it's an understanding of where you are in each one of these areas and what it looks like to make progress in each area. And so we're gonna be talking about a free tool today. So we'll get into the details of the tool in a little bit, but Conserve Cloud is primarily a tool to help analyze environmental data and then communicate it to the rest of your team. All right. And so what we've put together is a little quick survey and I'll share the link with you in just a second in the chat. It's six questions. Um, it's quick, it's anonymous. It's meant to help get a feel for the people on this call 
where we all stack up. So we'll do the survey and then we're gonna look at the data in real time, which we hope goes well. Uh, you know, sometimes these data collection things in real time go great. Sometimes we run into a few little speed bumps. So let me grab the link really quick. Let's see here. Let's see if I put it in a place where I can find it. There it is. All right, so I'm gonna put this in the chat. Okay, so you can click on it. If for whatever reason you can't see it in the chat, that link at the bottom is the survey. And so uh, if you have any issues with this, let's go ahead and put it in the chat and let us know and we'll try to resolve them for you. But let's just take a few minutes and do this really quick. It's really interesting to us, and I'll talk a little bit as you're doing this. It's really interesting to us when we work with people to understand where you are. If we wanna figure out where we're going or how we're gonna make progress, it's gotta be rooted in figuring out where we are today. And so that's what this survey is about. When it comes to data collection, where are you? No judgment, just where are you? You know, are you, are you not doing any data collection? You know, do you have hyperthermographs? Do you have historical data loggers? Do you have something wireless? Just understanding where you are is how we get started. So I am gonna go check on the data and see how we're doing. Doop -a -doop -a -doo. All right, we are getting some results coming in. Okay, so while we're doing this, because I want people to have some time to go through this, even if it's just a few minutes, um, I thought we could do a quick Q&A. So you have the Q&A up um, in, uh, in Zoom. And so what I'd like to go ahead and do is if you have questions that you'd like us to go ahead and get in our minds as we go through the rest of the presentation or things we wanna talk about at the end, please uh, go ahead and put them in there. So Sharon Penton, I, I see you uh, put a note in here. Um, Sharon asked, and I'll answer this live, right? Is there a recommended rate of data collection? Uh, she says she uses three to five minutes on the loggers that she has. And is there a recommended rate of how often you should be taking readings from your environment? Uh, this is interesting, it comes up a lot. And the way we tend to think about it is it depends a lot on how effective your HVAC system is, is in responding to your environment. Meaning if I went and moved the thermostat up a degree, how long would it take for that space to adjust? Because if it's gonna take 30 minutes for a space to adjust, then having that reading every five minutes isn't necessarily helpful. We want the readings to kind of be at the same granularity or the same kind of frequency as the systems that we use to control our environment. So Sharon, I hope that, I hope that answers your question. For us, when we install equipment for clients, we typically uh, do t every 10 minutes, so. Okay, I'm gonna hit refresh one more time on this survey. Let's see where we are. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Let me filter some things out. Okay, if you've gotten through the survey, could you just drop a note uh, in the chat and say, yes, I'm done. Um, if you're still having issues with it, uh, maybe drop a note and say, still working on it. All right, cool, 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 cool. All right, great. All right, there we go. Okay. So we have about, oh, I'll just pull the responses over so we can take a look at this together. Um, I am going to provide a live clickable version of this um, after the presentation. And it's really fun to click around. You can explore the data in real time. So what we've done is for people that uh, in each area, say, for, for example, data collection, say, well, I don't collect any data right now. We would just give you a score of zero. 
Uh, if you say, yes, I collect some point in time readings, we give you a one, two, three, you kind of get the idea. You kind of get a point depending on which level you're at. And so what we want to look at here is for organizations that are larger or smaller, different types of collections, how are people doing? So imagine looking at this middle area right here and just seeing unsurprisingly, right? I think, I think we're comfortable with this. Smaller institutions are not as mature in their efforts in these four areas as larger institutions. And that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Uh, part of the constraint, of course, is great tools. And that's one thing we're gonna be looking at as we talk about the Conserve Cloud tool uh, that we offer for free. So I'm gonna pull this over. You'll get a live version of this afterwards and you can click around your heart's content and like explore the data and it's, it's really fun. Uh, by the way, before I slide this off, like in my previous life when I said I did analytics, one thing that I was really focused on was Power BI. And so if you're on the call and you use Power BI in your organization, please reach out and say hello because it's a, uh, it's something that's still very near and dear to me as an analytics tool. All right, fantastic. Okay, so I said that Conserve was about listening and that's how we build our products. And so this Conserve Cloud, this free tool we're gonna look at for environmental monitoring, it wasn't just built on what we thought would be a good idea for the community. It was built by going out and listening to people and asking what you need. And that was at large collections, it was at small collections, everywhere in between. Our goal is to build something that's accessible for everybody. So a large collection with more resources is going to be more or less okay without us. When you get down to smaller collections with fewer resources, they rely on more free tools to be able to get the job done. And so we wanted to slide in there and make sure we had a tool that worked for smaller collections because most collections are smaller collections, uh, overwhelmingly. So Sarah Cordimer is somebody we work with at the University of the Arizona Poetry Center. She just said it really nicely, which is just that feedback helps us grow. It helps us grow individually in our own collections and it helps us build better things for the community. And so Conserve Cloud is this thing that's the product of us going out and having all these conversations. And before I talk about our tool, I want to make it clear that we're kind of in a golden age of analytics. There are so many tools out in the world today versus 20 years ago versus 10 years ago versus five years ago that are uh, amazing analytics tools that help people take data and turn it into information. And so I'll introduce a couple buckets here. I mean, the first one is things you might be familiar with. These are general purpose analytics tools, things like Excel, Tableau. You can use these tools with the environmental data you have to produce good analysis. The challenge here is it's very much uh, do it yourself. So these tools are not focused on monitoring and they're not focused on collections, but they're incredibly powerful. So you have to show up with a lot of subject matter expertise and knowledge of analytics tools to do this well. And in the second bucket, we have analysis tools that are focused on environmental monitoring. So many of you will recognize these as things you have in your own collection, things like uh, the Hoboware from Onset and other tools. Uh, all of a sudden you're in an analysis tool that is focused on monitoring, but it's not necessarily focused on creating a better collection environment. And that's what the third set of tools is about. So these are analysis tools that are focused on monitoring that are also focused on collections. And here, the learning curve is a little flatter if you're someone taking care of a collection, right? A lot of the assumptions of the things that you care about are already built in these tools. You just wanna show up with the data. So my message is you should know what your environmental monitoring analysis tool is. And for everyone, it's gonna be different. Uh, we work with people who still spend a lot of time in Excel and all over the board. Uh, there's no one answer that's right for everybody. The goal is to try to find the thing on this board that fits really well for you. And so I'm gonna introduce you to our tool, which is a free tool, uh, but I would encourage you to go and find uh, what fits best for your collection, right? That's the title of the talk, what's best for my collection. And that answer is gonna be a little bit different for everybody. So here's what we've put together. And I want you to understand a little bit about how we approach this. 
So as a company, our vision is a world where anyone who takes care of a collection can make progress every day toward better collection outcomes, no matter budget, geography, or capacity. So in our free tool, we try to address three things. One is that it is free, and that means unlimited users, unlimited amounts of data, unlimited amount of loggers. And the second thing is it's BYOD, that's bring your own data. So you don't need uh, to own the sensors that Conserve makes to use this tool. You can use any data logger out in the market. So we have lots of people who just use our software who aren't Conserve paying customers. And we love that, that helps us give back to the community. And then finally, it's a tool that's focused on analytics and sharing. So Excel is my personal favorite analytics tool, but it's not designed to figure out what's going on in your collection. You can't necessarily set an environmental level out there, understand what's going on with mold or casually review the weather compared to your space, right? It's not necessarily designed for all those things. And so that's what we've put together. This video is going pretty fast. I promise you, if you end up in our actual software tool, things don't move that fast. It moves at your own speed, but this is a quick recording to give you a sense of the look and feel of what we're trying to do. So in the free version of our tool, the things that we're bringing to the table are the major environmental readings that people care about. So temperature, relative humidity, and light. We've brought weather data right alongside your data in the platform so you can understand what's going on outside the building and how that relates to what's going on inside the building. Importantly, you can set environmental levels. We'll talk about this more in a minute, but the first thing we work on uh, with every uh, user is, do we have a good sense of what we're trying to achieve in our collection? And without a good clear goal, it's really hard to know month over month, year over year, if we're making progress. And then we've put together a series of uh, something from the business world, key performance indicators. If you hear someone refer to a KPI, this is what they're talking about. But what we've done is we've taken this squiggly line and we've tried to condense it into some simpler numbers. So still respecting the complexity of environmental data, but to try to simplify it a little bit. So for example, what percentage of the time this month were you within your temperature range, right? So to take this line and to say, 75%. And to be able to take that 75% number to go back and talk to a facilities person or the other people on your team and say, you know, can we make this number go up a little bit next month? What do we need to do? And have some simple numbers that are more like a scorecard. You can make observations in the tool. We call this see something, say something. So, you know, you see the relative humidity go up over the course of a day, something dramatic. You can make a note directly in the tool that says, uh, hey, you know, like someone left a window open and it rained and water got in the collection and the relative humidity went way up. We call this being good, not just to our teammates, but also to our future selves. It's the kind of thing where you can go back and look at that data in a year and say, oh yeah, that's what happened. And it's very common to have to explain those sorts of things when you're doing a facilities report, when you're you know, applying for a loan, when you're writing a grant, you want to have a good narrative to go along uh, with the data that you have. And then we also have things like facilities reports built in here. Uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, we also have integrated pest management tools in the platform. So the goal isn't for us, it's not just to build an environmental monitoring tool, uh, but to build a tool where we can look at all the different agents of deterioration. And environmental monitoring was the first thing we worked on. We're starting to work on pest now. Uh, it's a, it's a really fun evolution to sort of bring these things together for the first time. Uh, we're getting a lot of positive feedback. So what I wanna to present to you today really is if you wanna use this tool, how to get started. We have a collection survey. It's different from the survey you just filled out. Um, it's, it's still very brief, but we ask you things like, are you doing monitoring today? What are you doing? You know, what are your challenges? Are you in integrated pest management today? What are your challenges? You know, these kinds of things. We're trying to zoom in on that question of where are you right now? Because the way we use this survey is we'll set up a time for you to have a call with, if 
if you're listening to this and it's April 2021 uh, with Melissa King, who is a preventive conservator on our team, who's going to sit down with you with uh, your information about your collection and get the platform tailored so that it works for you. We're not just going to give you a free tool and say, good luck. Uh, We've just seen how often that doesn't work. We're going to give you a free tool and a knowledgeable preventive conservator, and we're going to put you on the phone together for half an hour and get our thing set up for you. And after that, you're, you're in the platform and you can start that process then of period over period, asking that yourself that question of, are we getting a better outcome for our collection environment? Which is what this tool is all about. So I wanna tell you a little bit more about the onboarding process itself, because this is really important. So it's really easy if you are not an expert in environmental monitoring, and if you're just getting started to feel a little overwhelmed by the process. There's some really critical things that if you do them once up front, then you've set yourself up for success. And so on the onboarding call, we're not gonna necessarily deal with every single one of these things, but these are some of the things that we typically talk about. So within our system, right, do you have a clear sense of your location and all the different spaces? That's where we usually start with people. And in each space, do you have a sense of what you think the environmental targets should be in each space? Should it be more or less the same throughout your collection? Is the storage area different? Is this gallery different from this one because the objects that are in it? What are your goals? We're going to introduce the key performance indicators to you so you understand how your numbers relate to the goals that you have for your collection. We're gonna show you how to record observations so as you see things, you can take notes for your future self and for your team. We'll look at, we'll make sure your weather data is set up correctly so you can see uh, what's going on outside your building and start to learn more about how that affects your collection. And we're gonna show you how you can invite the rest of your team uh, to the account. It's really cool, I think, in our application that you can bring your whole team. And that means management, it means the facilities people, if that's something you have in your collection, it might mean a board member, it could mean an outside consultant. The idea is to bring everyone into one place so we can start having this conversation and we're all looking at the same thing. So that's the onboarding call. Uh, It's really, we have some goals, like things we wanna talk about with you, but it is a call that's ultimately for you. And so we we will uh, let you lead us there, but we we certainly have some things to share with you during that experience. And, um, you know, here's a list of some of the people that, that we work with. And there are really two reasons I wanna share this slide. One is I want you to see that we don't just work with big folks. We do work with a lot of big folks. Uh, I didn't necessarily put their logos up here, uh, but we work with a lot of folks who I would call small and mid-sized institutions. Uh, these are not folks with you know, infinite resources, infinite staff. Uh, these are people with, with modest budgets uh, who are uh, using our tools to help make a difference in their collection. And the second reason is here, I want you to see that there aren't any restaurants, science labs, manufacturing companies, uh, you know, on and on and on. There aren't any other types of organizations on here. We build things for collections, uh, which is fun because that means if you email us, if you call us, you never have to spend any time explaining to anybody what you do, uh, which is a nice feature, right? You get on the phone, there's a shared understanding uh, about what we're trying to do together and we can start working on it. So I wanna leave a lot of time for questions uh, because that's really the crux of this. I have some more supplemental materials I can go through uh, to look and give you some tips in each one of the areas of collection and analysis, sharing and outcomes. And we may find ourselves there as we answer some questions. Um, But thank you for listening to that uh, quick overview. 
And what do you think, Susan? You want to answer some questions? Yeah, sure. Well, welcome back. Well, how about this? You know, what I've really enjoyed working on this with you, Susan, as well, because uh, you have so much experience, practical experience of being in collections and helping them get this right. So some of these, I think, you, you know, I want to know what your answers are to these. So Megan Ramsey has asked how many data loggers per square feet in a building and, you know, what height should you put these things? And basically, how do you decide how many sensors you might need and where to place them? Are you asking me? It depends. I'm asking you, it. yeah. <laughs> well, we know the answer is it depends. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you a story about a small museum that I went to do some consulting for and they told me they had rock steady environmental data, but they had a problem with uh, borrowed objects in a particular area. And what I realized as we were standing in that area that every time the door opened, there was a big eddy of cold air that went around this problem area. Even though the hydrothermograph, this is a while ago, that they were using was 10 feet away in a totally sheltered area. So nothing changed. And uh, when I got them to move that hydrothermograph, it, they saw that there was this huge up and down that went where these problem things were and they were able to take care of it. So it depends on how complicated your rooms are, how much stuff you have, but um, yeah, it, it depends. And yeah, yeah. this eye level versus ceiling floor, um, you could have drafts on the floor you could have eye level, you know, it really depends. So I was just going to say that um, I used to work in the Everglades. And so there it was, you basically any enter, any door that entered the Everglades, we tried to have stuff, even though we had like, you know, like the, the vestibule set up. So there could be some temperature control with those. We still would just put loggers by all the doors because we, had, we dealt with such extreme environmental differences throughout the year that that was always really helpful. So I think that sometimes it is kind of look at your your situation and kind of figure out the best places. Or if, if you know there's a trouble spot or you have a inkling that there's a trouble spot, the, I like usually putting loggers in those spots as well. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So just, it really depends on how homogenous your environment is. You can imagine a building that was one giant room and the air circulated perfectly and you could use one logger because the environmental conditions were all the same in this in the space. And you can imagine the same square footage that was a building that was broken out into 20 different rooms. And in each room, the air kind of moved differently. And we had to monitor them each separately to really understand what was going on. So it's really about the airflow. It's really a great way to think about it. So Michelle Persons asked, what's the professional standard for retaining environmental monitoring logs and how does the conserve system address this? So I'm not aware of any professional standard for how much you should retain, right? There's no, not necessarily any sort of uh, legal standard for maintaining things. Um, our philosophy is that data storage has become incredibly cheap. It, it, it's become incredibly expensive. So when we say on our free tool, you can have unlimited data, this is what we mean. You can have as much data in there as you like. And the idea be you can click a button anytime and export it in a nice uh, non-proprietary format like a CSV or something like that so that it's, it's yours. Um, we don't want people uh, feeling like stingy about keeping data um, because you just never know uh, when it will become useful in trying to analyze what's going on with a space. Yeah, for instance, if you have a room that has a slow leak, you might not notice it for several years. 
and um, that that would be an important thing that you would need to know that would help when you got that taken care of. As someone yeah. mentioned in the chat real quick, that there is an archival standard for retention of internal museum data, including environmental data. Um, if you want to put that number in the chat, feel free, just so everyone can see it. I know we always used to keep it by bank records, like seven years is usually what we would keep back just to keep that as a market across all records. But yeah, if you have, if anyone has any standards that they're following, feel free to throw them in the chat so people can kind of compare and contrast what people are using. All right, we have so many good questions, which I love. Um, it, it just philosophically, it like feels good to me. It's the same way we go out and build things as we like to listen to people's questions and, and just really have a conversation. So how about this? Um, what are some features in your software that you have received feedback as being the most useful? So this is from Laurie Noner, so th yeah, thank you for this. Um, it varies, right? Uh, Imagine uh, using a piece of software, if you're familiar with Excel, there's so many different features in it. Um, you have certain types of people that use different things more than others. And now we don't have as many features as Excel, but you do see a very similar thing. Um, I think what is far and away the most common uh, is the analytics part of the application where people are trying to take data and turn it into information. So this is a major constraint that we see, and we talk about it a lot, is that an organization can have data, but not have information, right? The data by itself, you know, can just feel overwhelming. You don't know what to do. So we'll get to this in a second, but things like the key performance indicators where we say, hey, you're within your temperature 70% of the time, the ability to quickly go and look at that and look at that across your different spaces and say, okay, like that's how we perform this month. And to be able to consistently do that month over month and get into that habit where uh, you're trying to understand if you're making progress or if you've, if you've regressed in some way, that is far and away the most common thing that people are doing is trying to answer that question of, are we doing well or are we not? I would say second to that is probably people making observations, right? Because it's, crazy if you're trying to put together a grant or a facility report for a loan and you're you have all this environmental data and you're going and trying to look through your email and trying to find oh i think last summer i sent an email about this to someone because the hvac system went down i need to explain this can i go find that email and and so uh, we see people getting into the habit of taking those notes directly in the data which is cool because then when you produce the report for that facilities report, all those observations are simply in there and you're done. And so that's become very, uh, very popular. Yeah, thank you for asking that, Lori. But at some point I'd like to ask you, you know, what's, what, what's, your, what's your favorite feature in the tool? I hope at some point uh, we get to have that conversation. Susan, Robin, you see a question out of here that you'd like to pull out? There's so yeah. many. I know there's great questions in there. And someone did share the, the maintenance timeline. So I appreciate that. I was trying to remember what was in the new facility report too. If they, I know last time I looked at it, it was calendar year for environmental standards, but I couldn't remember if it was much longer than that. Um, they are asking, someone did ask, how is the data from different museums in your cloud secured? So do you have cloud storage mm -hmm. when it comes to? We do, yes. Um, it certainly makes everything simpler to store things on the cloud. Um, we segregate uh, everyone's account through security, right? So, you know, you're only going to see your data. We do have some options, which I think are unique to our platform. You can invite someone from outside your organization to, to come and look at your data. So, if you work with a consultant and maybe this consultant works with 20 different collections, <clears throat> that person can log into their account and separately, right? They can go look at your data or at another, it, it's not aggregated together, but they have the ability to easily go and look in your data and work with you if you're interested in that. Um, otherwise everything, you know, is totally segregated and secure. 
Um, so. But I want to add, I think one of the interesting things about what Conserve is doing is that we all have collections with a lot of different stuff. And uh, a lot of our, the information that conservators have, have based the care of objects on are specific things like they did in, in um, they did accelerated aging studies on this or that kind of material. So the thing that conserve uh, in theory can allow us to do is to look at what real life aging is with different kinds of materials. And I think that's a, a really promising thing that it could do. Um, there's a question that I think you ought to answer, Austin, which is, um, if this is a free tool, how is it supported? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are a business uh, and we are in the business of selling uh, really high quality environmental monitoring solutions for collections. So um, we have wireless sensors that you can set up in five minutes. They're really easy to use. They basically take all the hassle out of the data collection and then all, all the pieces down line, things like real-time alerts and all that. So that's our business. Um, and as part of that business model, right, we offer this free tool. The free tool serves two purposes. Uh, one, it's for the community and it's meant to increase access to quality tools. But of course for us, it, it is also a marketing exercise. So if you use our free tools for a couple of years and you really like what we're doing and you think, oh, I could use some environmental monitoring tools, we would love to talk to you about that. But there's no, uh, you know, there's no requirement that anybody be, be a paying customer. So um, that's, uh, that, that brings us a lot of joy to work that way, actually. And um, so the business model is funded like other businesses through, through profits. And, you know, the way I like to think about that is a successful conserve is a business that brings continuous investment back into uh, the cultural heritage space. So we build better tools. We build new free, like take the IPM pest management tool we just built. We build new free tools for people. Um, so our success, uh, because we don't focus on a thousand different verticals, our success means that that, that money comes back into the field uh, to produce better, better tools. That's what we're about. Also, I think that um, an interesting thing about what Conserve is doing is that because they are a business, they are not relying on uh, grants that come in that may or may not be funded, that it, it's, it's a whole different way than we have done things. So I think that's an important thing. I just I'm gonna... really, oh, sorry, go ahead, Austin. No, no, you go ahead, Robin. I was just going to say, I just found a fascinating question because I've gotten into this argument when I worked full time at museums. It says, is the data analysis from this conserve cloud or anything helpful in convincing facility managers to help fix HVAC issues? I've worked with some managers that don't necessarily believe Hobo data loggers are as reliable as the HVAC readings from their system. And I know I have gotten into passionate debates with <laughs> operations people <laughs> about how my system says one thing and their system says something else. And it's an interesting time. <laughs> so I just wanted to get some comments from you guys about it, that. It's, so it's uh, ultimately, it's a, at the end of the day, it's a human, humans communicating problem. You know, it's not a technology problem. It's like people with different points of view trying to solve a problem together. But, uh, you know, we, we see this as a very common constraint that people feel is like that they're not necessarily on the same page. <clears throat> and, you know, if you have an HVAC sensor that's in the return up near the ceiling, and you have a sensor that's about eye level on the wall, uh, those can be really different, even though they're in the same room. And so it's just like having two clocks and trying to figure out what time it is. Uh, it, it often can be a little bit, bit maddening. So uh, the way we've tried to approach this is to build a tool that you can easily invite the facilities people in. So for example, you have a report that you're looking at, you can share it with just a link where you can email that person the link and when they click on it, they're looking at the exact same thing you are. So just to try to 
um, bring people closer together into one conversation. And it's not about whose data is right, because no one's ever going to win that conversation. Um, but it, it is about uh, the facilities people understanding that a sensor on the wall, you know, next to the collection that you care about is representing something different than a sensor in the return. And that sensor in the return is related to an HVAC zone that might have three or four different spaces associated with it and isn't necessarily representative of each space within your building. And so there's just, there's some mismatch there. Um, but the number one piece of advice we give people is to go sit down with those folks and ask them what's important to them. And to start there by sort of recognizing the work they're doing and having a really good sense of what their goals are and to try to find ways to help them meet their goals. And it's, it's great, you know, if you want to get love, you have to give it, you know, sort of how we think about it and to get people, help people get engaged in that conversation in the right way with the people they work with. Um, you know, you can create good relationships there, but uh, they don't always start that way. Uh, Susan, is that reflective of your experience at Robin? Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Right. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, this, Andrea Slater asks, my institution currently uses eClimate Notebook for environmental monitoring. Are mm -hmm. PEM2 mon uh, monitors compatible with Conserve? And then another person asked about, um, Will the analysis part of the software have features similar to IPI's dew point calculator time-weighted mm -hmm. preservation index? Yep. So eClimate Notebook is an awesome tool. I mean, you talk about being pretty bold, like, you know, and pretty early in coming out of the collections focused monitoring tool. Um, I, I see a lot of people who are using that tool and are completely satisfied with it. So we see them more as like a, you know, as an ally and trying to help people solve this problem together. Um, our tools are similar. Um, I think the, probably the big difference in my mind is the speed at which we operate. So my team releases new software every couple of weeks based on things we hear from people. And it's a really fast moving process. And it's not uncommon for someone to say, hey, like this feature would be really interesting to me. And then 30 days they have it. So it's a, it's a different kind of focus where uh, we move really, really quickly, but fundamentally you're gonna see some of the same things. So like the dew point calculator, things like mold risk, right? Looking at relative humidity and temperature, things like the time weight of preservation index is ultimately a, a damage rate calculation, right? So we have a similar set of calculations are, around damage rate. So you'll see very similar ideas expressed um, and uh, yeah, I, I, we're really looking for more, more feedback there. So we have some other things that we've added on there, like a score that we've provided. We also deal with light levels. So there's some things we have that eClimate Notebook's not doing. There's some things that eClimate Notebook's doing that Conserve's not doing. So it's really up to you to sort of figure out uh, what's going to work best for you. Okay. Um, Luis Enrique so, so Ares, um says, is this available internationally? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, we started selling our monitoring equipment internationally over the past couple of weeks, actually. That's like a new thing for us. And so we've had to go through the exercise of getting ready for GDPR in Europe and doing all these things right. And so wherever you are internationally, the software is available to you. We don't necessarily necessarily sell our monitoring equipment everywhere yet, um, but yeah, we are having conversations internally about doing some translations of the application as well. So, if you're one of those people uh, outside the country who's not English first necessarily, like make some noise. Like we want to like hear from you and understand uh, how we might support uh, non-native English speakers better. So. I, this is an interesting question saying, do you think the aggregated group data will help update environmental standards from the strict 70 degree plus or minus 
by 50% humidity, fabulous rule that we've always known, to something more flexible, sustainable, and based on geographic location, et cetera. Yeah. Now, I yeah. know that I've... I've on other projects, I've read that, you know, like the folks out at Getty and some other groups, like we're looking at different levels. And I know, you know, again, when I worked in the Everglades, those that 70 degrees, 50 plus or minus humidity was like laughable in the summers <laughs> to try to get that. So what are your thoughts on that? I have so many thoughts. And I think this is probably the way, this is probably the reason that Susan and I first connected. Is that fair, Susan, to talk, you know, talking about data and what we might be able to do to create better collection outcomes, to create more sustainable collection outcomes, right? And what we have today, the world we're living in, is we're basically in the dark, right? We have a general sense of what's better or worse for a collection. Meaning, you know, if it's a little cooler in your collection, that's probably a good thing. If it's a little less humid, that's probably a good thing, right? And we have some ranges that are out there. But we don't have a ton of data yet. And I'll say a couple things about where we might be headed. So the first is historically what we've done is we've gone and tried to create damage models around how a very particular type of object responds to a very particular set of environmental conditions. And those are laboratory experiments. They're relatively expensive. And when we get done with one of those, we have a very, very thin slice of understanding about the world because in your collection and all the collections represented here today, we have a huge diversity of objects, a huge diversity of environments, a huge diversity of different types of damage. And so building models in the old way will never solve the problem of figuring out uh, this larger context. What's cool though, is because we have diverse objects, diverse environments, diverse damage, that experiment is already going on in the world we are just not measuring it. And so if we can get to a place where we're measuring that better, we can use that larger data set then to build models that are much more relevant and more specific to the problems that you have based on your geography or your collection type or your building type or these different types of things. And so for small and mid-sized collections on the call, what's I, I think particularly interesting about this is we want to, with people's permission, to use data to help build those models, to, to, to give them to researchers, to give them to academics, right? And that way, as we're doing environmental monitoring for our collection, we're also contributing to this much larger story of figuring out how to help every collection. Uh, and that's a big data problem. And it's one that could be solved in our lifetimes. Right, like we could have a much, much better answer to that question other than here's the general guidelines. So uh, that's something I'm personally very excited about. Um, along with the international access, um, Madeline Rickard uh, said, when it comes to the cloud tool, are we able to negotiate to make sure that the data center that contains our data is within a specific country. Sometimes we have legal requirements to make sure that data is kept within a specific area. That's interesting. Yep, that's, that is not happening right now, right? So what we're gonna need to see us personally is like a lot of demand from a particular market where that is a requirement. I think, you know, Germany is like that. Um, and, you know, if I see a lot of folks in Germany who, who want to use our tools and they have that challenge, we will go and try to solve that for them. Uh, but it's going to be based on people, you know, people making noise and coming to us and saying this is really important to us. It's not terribly complicated to do. Um, it's just something that we'll do as needed. Um, Rick Kirshner asks, does your system allow overlapping multiple sensor data on one graph? Yeah, so we didn't get too much in the specifics of analysis, but we kind of think of three different views that people want to see. People want to see uh, one measurement, like show me temperature and show me the temperature outside, right? We think of a view where people want to compare readings. So show me temperature, relative humidity, and dew point for the space on a graph. 
And then the third one is show me different spaces compared against each other. So I want to see all the spaces in my collection. I want to see what the temperature looks like for each of those spaces together. Um, so our standard analytics package is, is those, it helps people answer those, those three questions. And um, Julianne Snyder asks, what about correlating storage room conditions with closed cabinet conditions? Also incorporating radon data captured inside of casework. Hmm. Um, that's the first time anyone's ever asked asked us that. Um, yeah, uh, which is which is good. We have had conversations about cases uh, and microclimates. Typically, just around temperature and humidity. Sometimes people are interested in CO two to try to understand the air exchange in a case. Like that's a thing we come up. We don't do that currently. Um, but we certainly have um, free and paying customers who have sensors in, in microclimates. Um, you know, if you have a hobo data logger in a microclimate, you take it out and you put it in conserve cloud. We just treat it like any other sensor. Um, I'm going to say the radon thing. I'm going to call it a little esoteric. Maybe that's not true. Maybe there are more people that are focused on that than I think. But we've built a system based on a technology, and we haven't talked about this, but our sensor technology is based on something called LoRaWAN, which is sort of this open format radio technology. And it's really easy in that, that technology to bring different sensors into the situation. So do you need a CO2 sensor, a water leak sensor, a, um, a radon sensor, if there is such a thing for LoRaWAN? It's, it's an open format, so we do, yeah, we do I support think, other types of measurement. I think uh, Julianne has uh, minerals, right? Ah, got it. Yeah, um, so uh, there, there've been a lot of questions about whether you can provide clients with information about using data to support organizational and environmental sustainability. There's been a lot of stuff about building sustainability and environmental systems. Can you address that? Yeah, I mean, so the first thing we do, you know, when you set up a new target for a space is we just, we make some recommendations. You know, we have templates, right? Like here is a template that's based on the ASHRAE standard for a more sustainable collection environment. So, you know, the first thing we can do is to try to nudge people in a direction and show them that there are different options when you're thinking about goals for a space, right? Here's the classical tight control. Here's a looser, more sustainable control. Um, that's where we're starting. I imagine we're going to end up in a space, uh, in a place where people can set different targets for different seasons of the year, so that they're, it's okay for their environment to drift up and down throughout the year, and, and we can capture that nicely. We're not doing that yet, but that seems very, very likely that we'll we'll work on that. Yeah. Um... More analysis questions here. Let's see. Right. Um, is is I think this is an important one from from D, uh, Stubbs Lee. Is there a way to integrate your software with our existing collections management system software? Yeah, you know we get this question a lot, um, and I think it's a it's sort of an open question for us, right? There's a lot of discovery here. Like te technically, right? It's not terribly complicated, right? You have to have some cooperation between vendors, but the question we're more interested in, right, is what what do you hope to accomplish with that? And I think a common answer we get is just to understand maybe condition reporting on an object level versus the environment. That's a very common thing. Um, uh, but we always go there next. Right? Can you integrate this? Yes, we could. You know, what are you know what are we shooting for there? And over time, I think if we can get a better answer to that question from people and keep asking why, 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 kind of in the right way, so we understand what's going on, that that's something that we, we certainly could do. We haven't really nailed down what's the true value of it for people yet. Um, Cecilia Winter says, 
I read on the website that Conserve wants to use data science to develop model, models for environmental degradation. Could you explore this a little more, especially how do you correlate damage with environmental data and how do you use this, the software to go beyond the traditional anecdotal mode? Yeah, so this is what we were talking about a minute ago. We are talking about using data from this sort of real world experiment that's going on. We use this big data set to build, build models. And of course the missing piece there right now for us is to understand damage, <clears throat> right? We have um, a basic sense of objects, at least you, know, you do coming from your uh, collection. We have a basic sense of environment, um, but to, to bring the damage into it, as a data set onto its own. And so, you know, I'm not sure quite how we're gonna solve that yet. Uh, we might try to do some of that ourselves. There are other wonderful companies that do um, digital condition reporting that could be good partners for us there. Um, it, it could, you know, there are a lot of different ways we might solve that, but expect us to be uh, coming up with a solution of that before the year's out, um, because that is the basis for a lot of the really interesting data science and uh, modeling work that needs to be done. I know um, in the chat, oh, go ahead, Susan. Um, here's another one that um, I guess we should talk about. With a free, this is from Catherine scribo Baker. She says, with a free tool anonymously or not, would our data be shared with third parties? No, no. Um, if, we, if we decide, to start handing data over to academics or researchers, right? It will be completely opt-in and it will be completely anonymized. You're not gonna like find out one day that we've shared your data with someone. That doesn't serve anybody. Um, so like the trust that people have around their data is critical. And if we violate that trust, then we have no, no, uh, we have no business like you know, serving this audience. So that's really important to us. I was just gonna say, it seemed like people got really excited in the chat and even in questions when you started talking about the IPM service mm -hmm. that you had just mentioned. I didn't know if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. We're not just an environmental monitoring company anymore. Uh, we're a preventive <laughs> conservation platform. We do monitoring and we do pest management. And this is just something that's come out over the last few weeks. Uh, we partnered with museumpest.net, which if you're not familiar with, is the, in my mind, like the resource to go and learn more about how to do IPM well, whether you're a small or a large place, right? Tons of great resources. We partnered with them to bring their pest database into our application so that as you're doing pest identification, you're using this really rich data set they have to kind of do it all in one place. And that's a free tool as well. Um, just, to give you, just to help some people understand our business model a little bit better and how, how, this, how we could make money off this. Imagine a world where you get your phone out and you take a picture of a pest trap with our app and it tells you what every pest is on the trap and it automatically classifies it for you and it produces the graph and you're done. That's really exciting, right? That's the kind of thing in our software that we would turn into a piece of paid software, right? Because it's totally magical. Um, and so our goal with our tools is to provide this really strong free layer. And then as we develop really valuable stuff in excess of what's already out there, those could be things that we ask people to pay for. But we're never going to take anything away. I mean, if there's something now that's free, it'll always be free. Um, there have been a couple of questions about um, people who work in small institutions. And one, uh, Valentina Perez Vela, um, says that she has a collection at home that she's monitoring. And uh, she's working on this collection for a conservation project for her bachelor's thesis. And she says, could I use Conserve? Uh, yeah, we partner with, uh, with academic programs and uh, people doing academic work all the time. In fact, there is a, someone's writing a paper right now. Uh, we were going to send monitoring equipment to an academic program, but 
no one's on campus or everyone's at home. So we ended up sending up to, we sent it to someone at their home and they set it up in their bathroom and they get this question a lot from people they work with, can I hang a piece of art in my bathroom? And people <laughs> generally say no, but she thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we actually knew? So there's this little experiment running around relative humidity, temperature uh, in a bathroom setting. Um, and so you'll see a paper come out about that. But for academic institutions, it's often the case that we, in addition to the free software we have, we, we very often will give free tools uh, to academic programs as well. So if that's you and you're interested in that, um, that's definitely definitely something we do. Um, there have been a couple of questions about how you bring in outside weather data. Um, yeah. Does it happen on its own or do you have to input it? And or also where does embedded weather, weather data, where is it pulled from? Yep, right. So the free version of this is it's pulled from your local weather station. So when you first sign in to conserve, we're gonna ask you, uh, you know, where are you? Like, what's your address? And from that information, we'll then go pull your nearest weather station. Now your nearest weather station might not be totally representative of the weather right outside your building. and the only way to solve that well is to take an outdoor temp and RH sensor and put it right outside the building. Uh, so we have a lot of customers that do that. Um, but what we found is for a free tool uh, using a local weather station is pretty darn close. And it helps people start to understand the basic questions around the building envelope and inside versus outside. So that's how we do it. Yeah. Um, what's the timeline for getting Hobo data loggers compatible with the conserved software? Um, so Hobo has an enormous number of data loggers. Um, you know, we tend a lot of people tend to think of that one small rectangular one. They have, you know, I don't know the exact number, but from our experience, they have 20, 30 different models. Even things that look the same may actually be a little different. And so we're committed over time to getting all of those working with our system. Um, but it's very often the case that we think we have it nailed and then someone will show up with something new and, it'll, and we'll have to go and work on it and make that work. So we're just committed to getting it and making it work over time. Uh, Hobo has a proprietary file format called .hobo, which, you know, which we're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to create you know, use that, right? That's something that they've built that only works with their system. It's the kind of thing that drives you crazy a little bit. Um, you know, we're committed to open formats. And so what, what a lot of our Hobo users do is upload all that data and export it to CSV and then bring that over. So we're, we, we have a lot of different ideas kind of in the pipe about ways to make that simpler. But currently it's, you know, bring your own data, show up with the CSVs and, and upload them from there, so. Um, like Elizabeth, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Elizabeth Cesar says, is onboarding a one and done situation? For instance, if we move out a data logger later, does it mean uh, reconnecting with conserve or can we do the reconfiguration on our own? Uh, are we talking about moving data loggers in a building? Is that? Um, there is a question about that too, but this seems to be yeah. if they add something later or if they move everything everything that we're going to teach you in onboarding are things you can do yourself setting up your spaces setting up your levels right it's not like we're configuring it for you and then what we want to do is basically stand right next to you as we do it um, and teach you how to do it so that if you need to add a new room or a new logger or add a new level those are all things that that you'll be able to do um, what we found is that if you get those things right from the beginning, more successful with the tools. So that's why we're gonna help you do it initially. But you know, one of our commitments is that we answer the phone, people call, we answer emails and, and we're just a, a very responsive team. So there's no, I don't want anyone to feel like there's a sense of one and done. Um, you know, Our goal is to help people be successful in getting better outcomes for their collection environment. And so if you have some challenge there, like, you know, we're going to want to talk to you. Um, 
D. Stubbs Lee said, I'm thinking in terms of linking local history data for any given artifact with environmental history data. Can you do that? Yeah, that's a really interesting. Uh, that, I love that, right? So we have this idea of provenance or, you know, sort of chain of custody where we know sort of the ownership of something over time, right? We don't have anything around chain of condition would be one way to talk about it, right? I know that this object, it lived in this space and then it moved in this space and then it got put in a crate and shipped here and then it lived in this space. What environments was that object in throughout the course of its lifetime? That's really interesting, right? That sort of all encompassing view. Um, and we, we refer to that as chain of condition. I, that may just be a word that I made up, but I think you understand the concept. So um, yeah, that would be a good use case for integrating into a collection management system would be to track the environment against where something physically was and all that. So yeah, like not, not something that's gonna happen right away, um, but seems interesting enough that it's worth working on at some point. I'd love to see that. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth was asking about moving or adding things. Yeah, so it's really common that you take a sensor and or a data logger and you maybe put it in another room. Someone else was asking a question, like we move our loggers around every, we don't have enough, so we move them around every couple of months to try to get a sense of what's going on. So in the application, you can record a move. So if you move a sensor, you can say, yes, it was here. And I moved it into here on this day. We have a little bit of work to do on the analytics side to make sure that's presented correctly. Because what you want to see if you're looking at a space, right, is you want to see the sensors that were reading in that space during that time period. Um, so we have a little bit of work to do there. But at a fundamental level, we have it set up so that you are able to, to record that and we'll get it reflected in the data in the right, right way. Because this happens, this happens all the time. And what's going on now is kind of crazy, right? You're sort of making a note in a spreadsheet somewhere, you're trying to keep up with it, or you're like renaming sensors. It quickly becomes a very, a very big mess we've seen. So I have a lot of respect for the problem itself. And uh, we've done a few things to try to make it easier, but we're not totally, we're not totally there yet. Yeah, um, it's interesting. Elizabeth Cesar says um, that issue came up uh, during the MPMA conference this past spring, the desire to integrate environmental condition monitoring data with CMS. Yeah. Um, Robin, you had something you thought should be answered. Oh, well, going back, <laughs> I do have a question I just found that I think is interesting, but going back to the data loggers, the hobos, like I always feel like those are like, you see so many different versions of those that it's almost like the zip drives from back when I was in college in school, like those giant clunky things that there's like that version, you see like hobo loggers with serial ports, you see them with USB connectors, you see them with all different mm -hmm. types. So I think a lot of people run into that issue. But um, going back to a question, someone posted specific to traveling collections. Are you aware of any data loggers that can be used in the cargo of planes? As do airline regulations, we've been having issues putting battery-based loggers within packing crates as batteries are not allowed in check-in. And the only reason, other reason I bring it up is because there's this whole deal with the fun of virtual couriers, right? Of registrars yeah. having to travel stuff without being there. So I didn't know if you had any experience with those or you've heard of anything to help with that kind of a process or if you guys have thought about it at all? Right, so we have. Um, if we're in the business of environmental monitoring, it makes sense that perhaps we should be monitoring things wherever they are, whether they're in storage, in transit, on loan somewhere, right? Um, the virtual courier thing is really interesting. There are a lot of people working on it. It's become really popular the last little bit. Um, we our our partner for virtual courier work is Articheck, and they have an interesting solution. Um, but it's all it, it's hard to do real time data in a plane. Uh, the the FAA is not or, or the FAA, which is the United States uh, Air Force, 
regulatory agency, or sorry, uh, airline regulatory agency is not cool with wireless transmission on a plane. So um, there's some really interesting solutions out there for that, but you're not going to see a world where you're getting real time data from a plane. Um, that's, that's not going to happen. Um, but it is the kind of thing where, and, and, and by the way, if you had real time data on a plane, what in the world would you do with it anyway? Right. Are you going to call the pilot or something, you know? So, but we do live in a world now where you can take the data afterwards and upload it and understand what was going on. Um, and I think people have this idea that real time everywhere all the time would be great, but if you're not able to act on the information, having real time data is not, not interesting or useful. And so I, I, when people think about virtual courier and monitoring, I want them to really be focused on at the end of it, when we're understanding, did this trip go well or not? Can we understand, can we sit down and understand what happened? Not so much like in real time while it's happening. That's a super good point. I kind of feel that way whenever I um I board my dogs and they offer that cam situation to view them. I'm like, what yeah. am I gonna do? Like, am I just gonna yeah. call them later? <laughs> like, it's very. So that's a good point. I like how you pointed that out when it comes to that. You know, you're really concerned with getting the data afterwards, not so much what's happening right then. So, good call. Um, there's there's gonna be a the icon uh. Conservation Paintings Working Group is working on a, a meeting to discuss virtual couriers. Um, there are a couple of questions about um, the kinds of reports um, beyond KPI and how this would fit into facilities reports. Um, can you? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, reporting in our application is an area where I think we're doing the basics well, uh, but there are lots of other things we could do. Uh, so for us, the basics, and you'll see in our recommendations about, you know, becoming a more mature environmental monitoring organization, you should have a report that you look at at least once a month. That's just how, how are we doing? How are we doing this month? How are we doing the previous month? Are we getting better? Are we getting worse? Where are the problems, right? So we have that. And then we also have a facilities report and we just, uh, we took the facilities report data from the AAM facilities report and our report looks exactly like that. So the idea is you could go put your data in there, click a button and then go fill in the numbers. Cause for anyone that's filled that out, it's like narrative, qualitative questions, right? Da, 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 data. And you get to that one page and it's like, oh no, right? Cause then you have to go get your spreadsheets out or get you and you have to like calculate these numbers that are actually not trivial to calculate. Um, and so we tried to make that really easy here, press this button, we'll give you the numbers, you can write them directly into the report and you're done. So that's what we've done with our facilities report is just try to make it easier for someone to actually uh, fill out the facilities report in the US. Um, if, uh, this, there are two questions here. If somebody requested access via your website, are you automatically added to the to a wait list? Um, how yeah, long do you have to wait. Absolutely. So we're just trying to get people off the wait list as fast as we can. Um, you know, it takes some time to sit down with people for review their survey data, sit down with them for thirty minutes. You know, um, so I can't promise you anything there other than we are going as fast as we possibly can. And uh, that when it when you get off the wait list and it's your time, you're going to get our full attention. Uh, and you're going to have a, just a totally personal conversation with you. But yeah, if you go to the website and you fill in one of the get started forms and you fill out the survey that we have, you're on the wait list. You're ready to go. So yeah, I Robin, we're going to have to quit in a few minutes, right? We are, we probably need to start wrapping up. I didn't know if Austin, if you had a chance to share the results from the survey you took earlier, or if that would be possible, or if we wanted to link that to the website, it's either option. Yeah, yeah, I think the easiest thing to do is if we're gonna do a follow-up email for attendees, is just to provide them the link where they can go and look at it and click around. Um, Sounds good. Cause like reviewing something like that is best done in a quiet place with maybe a little bit of coffee and like, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, do we guys have any final thoughts for today's presentation? Um, I, I want to say that um, for the questions that we didn't answer, I'll make sure that they get answered and we'll give them to Robin to post um, on the website. 
well, what I'll do is I'll pull the report and then we can see which questions were not answered or not. Yeah, right, right. That's easy enough to do for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for their time, whether you're listening live or you're listening to the recording, like just thank you for spending 90 minutes of your life with us uh, to talk about environmental monitoring in your collection environment. And my one takeaway I hope for people is that after thinking about this a little bit more that you um, find that place where you can focus on progress for your collection and not, not be too concerned about perfection. Uh, if we can get in that mindset of like figuring out where we are and just figuring out what it takes to do a little bit better every month, every year, that's a wonderful place to be. And that's how we end up getting to where we need to be for our collection. So, but yeah, thank you for your time. Right. And I want to thank you. This has been really fun to be on the other side of connecting to collections care. And I've really enjoyed working with Austin. It's, it's, I think what they're doing is really interesting and can have a lot of, uh, can really help a lot of people. So that's that. And it was nice to see Mike. Yeah, exactly. Well, I wanna say a huge thank you to uh, FAIC, to Learning Times for acting as our technical producer. Of course, to Austin and Susan for um, doing this presentation. We appreciate it. It was recorded. Um, we'll be posting it online probably by the end of the week. I also put in the chat uh, links to the survey that we use within C2C Care to make sure that we continue to uh, improve our programming and a link to the website, which has the handouts and a copy of the presentation that's already up and ready for you guys to grab. So um, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you to everyone. Does everyone else want to say thank you or goodbye or anything else? Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and we will be back in May for collection emergency kits. So we'll see you in another month. Thanks, everyone. Bye.